Gracias, Rafael. Uh, tenemos tiempo para 10 minutos para una discusión global uh, con los ponentes. Si hay preguntas. T tengo una pregunta para los tres. Hay tan, tan, tan pregunta con la, el futuro de la terapia focal, pero una pregunta es le, cuál será el, el mejor mecanismo de destrucción Uh, celular, porque es un mecanismo diferente, de entre, uh, uh, como hemos visto, en, entre una terapia térmica o una terapia de, de láser. Y uh, en, el, en el futuro, ¿qué piensas, qué, qué piensas que será el mejor mecanismo para una un real destrucción casi definitiva y con un nivel de recurrencia uh, no demasiado alto? Uh, th thank you for your question. I think we, we base mainly on technologies. Uh, I don't know if we have the same questions. Uh, I don't know. We have the harmonic scalpel. We have the uh, the, um, the ligature. You have the you have six of these. And I used one. My colleague used another one. The, I, I was with the visceral surgeon. They used another one. And we don't ask these questions, right? You don't say which one is better. But I, to come to you to your question. I think the one which is going to win is the one you can better control, which is a different story. Controlling, uh, and I appreciate the, 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 the lecture from um, Sanjeev, is I use the one which I think I'm more safe and which I rely more on that. Uh, it's not certain is the best one to cut tissue or to acquire tissue, but I, you know, I feel safe. And I feel I can dissect and can do it. It's doing the job I want him to do. And so I think the control is much more important than the, the real ablation effect. Because I think all of them can ablate tissue. That, that's not the issue to me, but I don't know. I, I agree, um, you know, my experience um, thermal ablation, whether high flow or laser, um, PDD of course is different, uh, but um, um, diode lasers. And I think it's uh, all the tissues, all the kind of ablative te uh, technologies can ablate. Uh, there's no question about that. Um, um, there's, there's definitely an advantage of doing it in MR, but then it does become more expensive. Um, so there's, you know, pros and cons. Um, I'm, I feel much safer. I know exactly where am I treating. I can see it. I see the thermal energy being deposited. Uh, there's only a three-second delay in the feedback. And, and so if this energy is going in, and I have my cursor there. The tumor is in the posterior uh, peripheral zone, very close to the rectum in the midline. Uh, the moment I see that, you know, uh, the temperature is going to 85 degrees, I can shut it down. Um, so that gives me the confidence. Uh, we've not had any uh, fistula, uh, no rectal injury. Um, in, I, I think we've treated f about uh, about 100 patients in the magnet or 120 patients in the magnet in all our uh, studies. Uh, we've not had any major complications in any one of the patients. Yes, I think, you know, we still have some recurrent disease, though. I mean, you know, you say that you're using MR, you're using uh, uh, proper technique, you have the MR thermal feedback. Why do you have uh, residual disease? Like, you know, even if it's two patients out of 31, um, uh, uh, that's an issue. And I think it may be related to the margins. Um, mm -hmm. Um, you know, maybe the tumor is extending a little more in one direction than the eight or nine or 10 millimeters that we planned. And I think that's where we need more data at this time. We are hoping um, to do a few studies in our PET MR magnet. Uh, just move five of our patients in the present trial to the PET MR magnet, uh, inject PSMA, um, the tumor will light up. Um, um, and then ablate, and then again um, do the PSMA scan without having to inject again to see. I don't know if it will work or not because there's going to be some hyperemia, and, and hopefully if it works, then you don't see any more PSMA uptake, which may mean that, yes, you have killed all the tumor. Uh, I don't know. It's a thought. So we're moving five treatments to the PET magnet uh, in this trial. Yo, yo pienso que más, más allá de, de colocar la granada dentro de la próstata y esperar que funcione, 
eh, hay que tratar de, 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 de tratar el tejido. Y esta, esta idea del PET es algo que, que hemos pensado, es tratar de hacer eh, el, el PSMA, porque el PSMA va, va a delinear la lesión probablemente, pero también puede llevar un ligando que trate la lesión o que nos coloque en una posición de, de mayor seguridad y luego, y luego agregar la energía. Yo creo que... Eh, lo hemos visto, radioterapia más hormonoterapia funciona mejor que radioterapia sola, esto todos lo sabemos, y, y probablemente, aunque, aunque la, 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 la parte térmica no tiene la, la, el, la acción sobre el DNA que puede tener la radioterapia, sin duda es una combinación lo que probablemente en el futuro va, va a dar mejores resultados. Perdón, una pregunta para todos los ponentes. ¿Hay alguna de las eh, energías que sea mejor con vistas a una intervención posterior? ¿Una cirugía, quiero decir? Para hacer la cirugía. Es decir, en el tiempo no tenemos datos sobre cómo van a acabar estos pacientes. Entonces la pregunta sería, ¿podemos utilizar la terapia focal como una terapia inicial en una secuencia de tratamiento a largo plazo, utilizando una energía que luego no comprometa los resultados quirúrgicos? Bueno... A largo plazo. Voy, voy a, voy a un hablar un poco de eso en la, en la próxima presentación. En realidad, eh, con cualquier energía se van a comprometer los resultados de una u otra manera. Probablemente la, la cirugía más difícil es la que hay que hacer luego de, de crioterapia. Pero como uno está tratando solamente una parte de la próstata, siempre tiene la otra parte con la que puede avanzar en la cirugía y hacerla un poco menos difícil si la comparamos, por ejemplo, con una cirugía por radioterapia, que es una cirugía bastante difícil. Pero... A mi forma de ver, radio, eh, es crioterapia probablemente la, la, la cirugía más difícil que uno pueda, post-crioterapia quiero decir. Okay. Sí. Um, I think it obviously depends by the extent of your ablation and uh, cryotherapy is very difficult to do very small ablation because you, you have to put the needles uh, around the lesions. So obviously as, as less as you treat the easier it is your surgery. And uh, so I think after focal uh, laser, uh, it, I, I've, I've seen too, it was, it was not very difficult actually. Um, actually, the, the guy who was in my video uh, at the residual disease, we had to do surgery on him. That's real life, uh, he witnessed for, the <laughs> for our video and then it didn't work. And uh, I mean, It's not, it's not very, very difficult. I, I think the nerve sparing is the issue because obviously there is a lot of uh, fibrosis around. And I think the real question is the trade-off. How much you, you want to sacrifice uh, or you're able to risk to have the chances to not go surgery. And it's, it's a balance. It's a balance between things. So obviously, the more you have to treat, the more likely the patient to residual disease. So it makes less interesting, I think, the, the focal approach. But the less you have to treat, the more you can do a good surgery afterwards, and, the, and so it's more interesting. Surgical experience after electroporation? I've not, not, myself have not done any. I've seen two patients in London who have done this. Um, it was very variable, and I think the problem with electroporation also in our trial is that we didn't define uh, how was the treatment around the needles. And we really thought it was only in between the area, but that's not the case. And so one patient, uh, he, he actually could not see anything. It was an anterior lesion in which there was no fibrosis. And the other one, there was a lot, a lot of scar tissue, which is impossible to see whether it's because of tumor or because of the, uh, of the treatment effect. <laughs> que posiblemente los pacientes que alcanzan un nadir por debajo de 2.5 de PSA tendrían una evolución favorable. Yo, mi, mi impresión es que el nadir en una terapia focal eh, es bastante intrascendente porque los factores que influyen para alcanzar un nadir más bajo o no tan bajo eh, van a depender pues, del volumen total tratado, del PSA de donde partimos, del volumen que tenía la próstata… Eh, en definitiva, no puede ser el mismo concepto que cuando hacemos un tratamiento radical, bien sea cirugía, bien sea radioterapia, donde los criterios de nadir están claramente definidos. Mi impresión, y no sé si estaréis de acuerdo, es que, 
parte, por supuesto, de la biopsia, en el seguimiento, etcétera, pero desde el punto de vista de PSA, lo más importante sería la cinética de PSA, no tanto el nadir que hemos alcanzado, porque insisto que es una variabilidad donde van a influir tantos factores que no creo que tenga relevancia. Claro. La, la mayoría de, lo, de, los, de nuestros pacientes fueron pacientes que recibieron hemiablación y la mayoría de estos pacientes, eh, más del 85% de pacientes, son pacientes que, que tienen una próstata inferior a, a 50 gramos. Este 2.5 es nuestro trabajo en la data, en los, tratando de determinar qué, 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 qué nos conduce a una variable. Sin duda la cinética es importante, nosotros tratamos de hacer un análisis de cinética y ahora estamos haciendo, con uno de nuestros fellows estamos haciendo un análisis que, que la idea es tratar de establecer un, un, una aproximación multivariable, no solamente decir 3 más 3, 3 más 4, pero una aproximación multivariable como podría ser CAPRA, como podría ser un, un nomograma que nos permita determinar qué puede suceder en el futuro. Sin duda, es el porcentaje de, 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 de descenso del antígeno prostático lo que pudiese ser más importante en el, en, en el posoperatorio. Yo tengo una pregunta al doctor para los tres. A la hora de elegir una energía, ¿qué factores químicos nos hacen eh, decantarnos por una o por otra técnica? Como solista, publicasteis del modelo a la carta. Yo no sé si. Yo no sé si en vosotros en Toronto o vosotros en Máximo tenéis también esa, ese criterio suyo o estáis de acuerdo con él. Sorry, I get the full question. Um, si utilizas. Yes. Uh, the question was uh, how you choose your technology based on the patient features or other characteristics. Yes, for sure. So, uh, high flow and laser, it's very easy for us to choose if. Um, If the patient has calcification in the beam path, I cannot take him to HIFU. I'll take him to laser. If the, um, it's a 100 gram prostate, there's a tumor in the interior gland, no question. He's going to go to laser if it's a small lesion. If the lesion is at the apex, um, I, I prefer to take them to laser um, just because I can have good control on the amount of energy. So that's how we decide. Some patients are eligible for both. Uh, you know, a good lesion, a posterior lateral peripheral zone at the mid gland, I can take them to both, to be honest. Um, and it's a clinical trial, depending on how good the accrual is. Um, but, but there are certain patients who can only go to one of the two. Uh, that's how we decide. So we, we actually follow uh, pretty much the, 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 the model uh, Monsori proposed uh, for, I would say, for anterior lesions uh, and needle based strategies. So we have cryo. And we do that for posterior lesion. Uh, we choose IFU. I think there are very few lesions uh, which you can treat with both. Uh, for example, uh, the anterior lateral in small glands, you can you might treat with both. So in those cases, uh, we prefer IFU uh, just because uh, it's less invasive. And so it's, it's more, you know, when you talk to a patient about both, they they they're likely to choose uh, IFU. But I really think you you have to adapt to the to the patient really. And uh, I have seen some cases in which, you know, you, you want to do a case and, you, and we, we, we all had in our initial experience uh, in which we want to do something and we, we didn't select the, the, the good energy. Nosotros le llamamos a la carte y, y es a la carte que no solamente tiene que ver con el tratamiento, tiene que ver con la selección del paciente, con el, el tipo de biopsia. No hay una sola, un solo tipo de biopsia que sea, que sea la ideal. No hay un solo tipo de energía que sea la ideal y es, es a la carte o como le dicen los americanos, ahora le dicen toolbox, nos no quieren robar la idea. Este, este toolbox, esta caja de herramientas, es lo que va a funcionar en el futuro. Uno trata de, de, de utilizar lo que se adapte más a la situación a la que tiene que enfrentar y no tiene la misma pistola para matar a todo el mundo. Ok, muchas gracias a los ponentes. Uh, una palabra para concluir, pienso que es muy importante que los rugos uh, uh, hacen un, 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 son, uh, hay que investir el campo de la imagen de, de la, del mecanismo de energías para, para conocer mejor esta terapia y que no, sola, no hay solo, solamente la cirugía, hay que, que pensar en el futuro, el futuro es un partido de, de, de cirugía, pero también otras tecnologías y hay que investir este campo. Gracias a los ponentes. Muchas gracias.